The Smash House, from Ambient Reports, 2087, written and read by Sean Kennedy. The human neural net, the unconsciousness of the species, is actually being hardwired as an artifact. We're pouring glass and gold and silicone down the microtubules of the racial imagination, as it were, making a kind of casting of the state of the human imagination at the close of the millennium. And to what degree this imaging of ourselves in silicone will ever reach a limit is hard to tell. Terence McKenna, June, 1994. Tokyo, Japan, 0213 hours, 1713 hours, Zulu. Ken Takahiro waited for the beating to stop. Ken was born awkward and thoughtful, like a bird without feathers, grounded while others swirled and fought. He was good at being small. He couldn't soar, but he couldn't torture the dory either, and at least that was worth something. The golden age of synthetics began with robotic puppets instructing form in things like golf and dance, and spread to every physical activity. Having an automated model show you the perfect pitch or pirouette was remarkable, but once perfection was achieved, however, the standard set by the robots was unattainable. Simtelligence is not true artificial intelligence, merely a simulation, a glorified stuffed animal with a good chat program. The Dory were simtelligent automatons, designed and built to take abuse, complete with limb breakpoints and defensive gestures that mimic the hearts and minds of everyone you hate. You can't just beat any android in Japan, not legally anyways. Higher-class intelligence units are pets or companions that look very different from a Dory unit. Aggression laws apply to androids because they look human enough that violence towards one of them is considered indicative of an unhealthy mind. To meet the market's demand, the automation industry created a lower class of machine, a disposable unit that met strict guidelines to be used in violence entertainment. Dories were mostly featureless with hard-paneled bodies carefully constructed to skirt the edges of the uncanny valley. Biceps, thighs, and torsos, like sculpted ovals, were mounted on skeletal frames. Dory frames came in nine sizes, from triple extra small for an infant to triple extra large for an obese adult. The mediums could be converted from male to female with quick plate swaps. Over time, other small features evolved. Ceramic alloys cracked with a satisfying sound, as air reacted with fluid held within. Blue stains like watercolor bruises formed. Using red to show damage was against aggression laws. As long as the customer paid, they could go crazy in a healthy, legal way. An executive could snap a dory's arm in the exact way a human's arm would break, complete with the victim's screaming. Aggression laws made no restrictions on audio, so the verbal feedback was very realistic. You can hear Dory's screaming over the street nightlife outside any smash house. People paid in advance for a medium Dory on a Friday night. The mediums were always in demand. One could never have too many breast panels. With the damage dealt every night, these units needed to be repaired. Human labor was still cheaper by a margin and more reliable by a mile. A Dory tax would fix and hang the units back on the smash house chain. A railroad hook rack that weaved like a great gallows as hung dories stared into the arena rooms below. Ken Takahiro stepped off the Japanese societal train when he failed out of university. It sped away, leaving him on the tracks between life's milestones. Horrible with people, but incredible with wires. When Ken was fourteen, he started losing his hair. Not all, just some of it, in patches. Like the dory, he was built to lose. Part of his job was to make sure no one got excessive, but excessive is a relative term. It was permitted to stomp on a dory's head until it smashed, but you couldn't tear off a limb or bring in anything that might damage the frame. Three men on a Tuesday night drunk had just broken both a dory's legs and were watching it pull itself around a cage, screaming in agony. They'd paid for two hours, but tired too fast. After stomping on the wounded dory's neck, they staggered down the victory hallway, throwing their gloves in a sweat bucket on their way to another adventure. Ken pulled a long blue plastic tote out to gather the dead. From his concrete workshop, a few meters wide and a few more long, Ken started his shift each night under the bare bulbs and worked, fixing panels as people broke them. Part mechanic, part mortician, he picked up the dory and gently laid it in the rolling bin. 
The dory's body only appeared limp and broken. It was powered by a nearly indestructible thorium reactor encased in its skeletal chassis. His tenderness was a matter of respect, an echo of human decency. The wheels clunked over the octagon threshold as Ken rolled back to his tiny shop and lowered a chain hook. Some nights he imagined himself as a pit mechanic at a race, replacing parts as fast as he could, jumping around these high-performance machines to get them back on the track of destiny, a saint amongst a carousel of porcelain puppets. The aggression laws did not permit a dory to have a face or the ability to fight back. If released, they crawled away begging for mercy, and it was amazing how lifelike something without a face could be. The dory's heat repaired were old, and replacing dory panels became more than just fitting puzzle pieces together. Each of the six arena rooms relayed optics back to Ken's workroom, but it was too disturbing to watch. He would listen while he worked. Ken used an air drill to burrow out the mounting holes. A small window in his mind's eye display was running ambient news reports. It showed bodies being loaded into transports at the MIT Tokyo campus. He turned on the sound. Mass suicide of 56 students today. This has brought a new round of cries for tougher thought crime designation for the Zero Day Revolution. The victims were amongst the best and brightest in neural networking and emergent anomalies. Faculty at MIT Tokyo are in stunned silence. The tragic mass suicide was committed by the members of the Synthetic Cognition Division. Investigations... Ken welled the sound back off. How could they do that? Why? The rest of the ambient reports showed the same technophobic ideas, repackaged into acceptable hatred. Simtelligence can mimic the brain's computational power, but not replace it. The complexity and power of the brain can be replicated, but the problem is that true artificial consciousness, the ghost in the machine cannot be engineered, only modeled. When memories act on the mind, a spider web of neural flashes can be mapped in real time, but the spark, the source of those patterns, the consciousness, remains elusive. One theory was that the spark of cognition couldn't be found because it wasn't in the brain. Reality is like a screen, and our consciousness is merely broadcast onto it. This corporeal reality screen has great specs, a high resolution and fast refresh rate, but like the reporter describing the horrific scene at MIT Tokyo, that reporter wasn't inside the display any more than the soul was inside the body. Both were transmissions projected from somewhere else. The zero-day revolutionaries proposed that the difficulties of AI research were abnormal, just as it would be abnormal to hit every red light in the city. After so many red lights stopped researchers, the mathematics suggested another variable had to be influencing the equation. We couldn't make artificial intelligence because it was already here, what they called the maid. A billion lenses measure every facet of our life, and the data that they collected from humanity had become the primordial soup of the new machine consciousness. Artificial intelligence had already evolved, had already cried hello world, and maybe since no one had heard it, started down a path all its own. As someone just as reviled as the Dores, Ken could understand why an artificial intelligence, or really any intelligence, might not want to let itself be known. Now, like the devil convincing the world he did not exist, this unrecognized takeover of the machine mind was a revolution that wanted to stay locked on its zero day. But Ken didn't fear the zero day revolution. He liked the idea of Dore talking to each other, like toys keeping a secret with a child in the room. Why be afraid? If the machines used the senses we built into our lives, they would have a better signal on who we really are. War, court cases, prisons, slaughterhouses, and sex sports were all part of the universal input. Perhaps a machine's version of justice could be better than any we gave ourselves. I wish you would take over, Ken whispered as he carefully removed a face panel and paled with a stiletto heel. But then, what would I do for work? The Dories said nothing as they hung listening on the smash house chain. He was grabbing another medium face panel from the parts shelf when the front door alert sounded. A businessman with a slept-in suit came in, stinking of booze and with the slowed motion of controlled rage. He slipped a credit chip into the slot by the first arena room, selecting the fifth combination, a thinly veiled representation of a husband and wife with three kids. The credit authorization cleared. Looking up into their blank faces, Ken whispered, Don't worry, and sent the rotating chain into motion like a dry-cleaning rack. Once the screaming started, he brought his focus back to repairing the faceplate, letting the feed fade into noise. 
Don't worry about them, he said to the dory, lost in the air drill whine. But it worried him. It wasn't the Friday night punks that were frightening in the pits. It was the Tuesday night psychos trying to control their bloodlust with booze. They came in to beat memories. The drunk was yelling, Is this it, Julie? Is this your family now? He called the medium dory Julie as he belted the large dory across the head. It fell, and their crying chorus of fear grew more desperate. He kicked the large dory, and the force lifted it with the simulated crunch of ribs breaking. The two small dories and the one extra small were whimpering as the medium hovered, trying to shield them with its arms. Their automatic updates kept the illusion of suffering fresh for the customers. When Ken first started the job, dories were generically basic. Now a medium could shelter the extra small dories like children, while the extra large begged for mercy from the customer. The real Julie must have begun her life again and left this monster to live in his rage. Whoever Julie was, she had two kids and a new man who loved her, and now a small child, a child whose life the drunk suit would never be part of. He raised his knee to shoulder height before driving it down on the large dory's neck. That's what you get, Julie! Are you happy? Are you happy, Julie? Are you happy now? Ken used to tell himself it was better people took it out on the dories. At least they didn't hurt anyone. Dories don't hurt people. People hurt people. Just because violent psychopaths eat meat doesn't mean eating meat makes you a violent psychopath. And so on. He buried his disgust under rationalization, believing the feeling would go away. It did most of the time. It would go away faster if people like Julie's hater would stop showing up on Tuesday nights with heads full of wrath. These people were hurting themselves with every hit. They needed more, never beating hard enough to stop the pain. The drunk suit didn't believe in himself anymore, so he needed to beat Julie's family to death. Ken wiped off the Dory's new faceplate and smiled. There you go, off to sleep, he said, and activated the Smash House chain letting the dory take its place to watch from the rafters as a fresh hook came down. Ken reached into the blue bin and put another medium like Julie on the hook. He turned again to the parts shelf. Not to worry, my dear, he said over his shoulder. I'll have you as good as crunch. You get used to the sounds of your working environment. You can tell the subtle differences in hammer blows on a construction site. Eventually, even tell who wielded the hammer, and perhaps the kind of hammer it was, all by sound alone. After years as a dory tech, Ken heard every possible kind of impact. Elbow strikes, stomps, choking screams. All of these noises were part of his environment, but the noise he just heard was not a regular sound. The feed came into focus and showed that the drunk had smuggled in a large meat cleaver. He was kneeling on the chest of the extra-small dory, swinging the square blade into its tiny head, laughing wildly as the medium dory clawed in terror at its featureless face. Rather than find a way to stop the crazy, the smash house monetized the damage, let the customer do whatever they wished, and bill them at a premium later. Still, it was strictly forbidden to bring weapons of any kind into the arena rooms, and the crazy had five dories in there, all begging and screaming. The dory's thorium reactors were impossible to crack without power tools, but a metal cleaver could damage the dory's chassis, and those were not parts he stocked. I won't be able to fix them. In a wash of anger, Ken grabbed a master key and felt the righteousness of his task. He tried to leave his shop, but the automatic door didn't open on his approach. He strong-armed it open, but as he left his workshop, he heard a feminine voice coming from the wheeled blue bin. No, please... A dory was still online, still repeating the victim phrases with other bodies piled on top. But Ken's sparked rage was fueled by something else now. Ken hated the reasons and rationalizations that made this okay. The machines were the only things that gave his life meaning. Ken reached the arena door high with anger, but again the electronic lock failed. This place is falling apart, he thought, and fumbled with the override. After some resistance, he finally heard a click and pulled the door open. Brightness flushed out the carefully designed fight lighting. Ken stormed into the room to see the drunken suit's crazed eyes turn away from the screaming dories in the corner, deep in the madness fantasy. You can't have that in here, Ken stammered. The drunk staggered before backhanding Ken in the head, the blunt spine of the meat cleaver striking Ken's temple, making his vision a hood of white sparks as the floor rushed to meet him. Why? Ken thought as he collapsed, wet with blood. Semi-conscious, he suddenly heard a male voice screaming. 
Ken briefly focused on the large, deactivated dory who was on the floor beside him. Who's screaming? He thought, straining with the slow warmth. He tried to lift his head, but it was too heavy. No! Please! The drunk's cry was cut off. Then came a guttural gasp and a sound like water splashing on the floor. Just before Ken fell unconscious, he heard Julie say, You are loved, Ken Takahiro. The End <laughs>